It's great honor to present for you today Ambassador Ilan Suleimanov from the Republic of Azerbaijan. Ambassador Suleimanov has led a long distinguished career in the diplomatic service, culminating in his appointment by President of the Republic of Uzbekistan, Ilham Aliyev, as Azerbaijan's ambassador to the United States of America. Prior to that, for over five years, Mr. Suleimanov has been the nation's first Consul General to Los Angeles and the Western States, leading the team which established Azerbaijan diplomatic presence on the West Coast. Earlier, he served as a senior counselor at the Foreign Relations Department Office uh, of the President in Baku, Azerbaijan, and as press officer of the Azeri Embassy in Washington, D.C. Mr. Suleimanov's experience before joining diplomatic service includes working with the United States Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Azerbaijan, as well as with the Open Media Research Institute in Prague, Czech Republic, and the Glauberville Czech, a leading manufacturing company in Central Europe. Uh, he's a graduate of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, Mr. Suleimanov also holds degree, graduate degrees from Political Geography Department of Moscow State University, Russia, and from the University of Toledo, Ohio. Mr. Suleimanov has authored numerous articles and is a frequent presenter at academic events. He speaks Azeri, English, Russian, and the Czech languages. Please join me in offering Ambassador Suleimanov a warm Deal Academy welcome. Where do you want me to speak? Where do you want me to speak? If you'd like to do up front, and I'll, I'll manage that. All right. So if you put a map, that would be good. To me. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I know you have much more interesting things to do, or maybe you don't, I don't know, uh, than listen to a heavily accented diplomat from Azerbaijan. So thank you for being here. Now, it's a great honor for me to be here in your presence. It's a great honor to be in this uh, great institution. We had a tour of the Naval Academy, and I saw the great tradition here. First of all, congratulations on being accepted and getting your education in a place like this. That's, of course, uh, a great honor for anybody, but uh, I especially given the fact that so many distinguished graduates from here went on to become leaders of the United States and very distinguished people. It is a, there is a special, almost nostalgic honor for me personally being here because in 1999, our national leader and former president, Heider Ali, spoke at the, at the academy, uh, and very successfully so. He actually spoke at a mess hall where we just dined, and he uh, strategically used the f version of a beat army statement, which this time I tried not to use out of respect to our defense attaché colonel, army colonel, uh, <laughs> Mr. Guliev. <laughs> um, having said that, let, I know we don't have much time, so I'll try to do as brief as possible. So what is Azerbaijan first? Uh, let's see if we can get the map. For Azerbaijan, as for the rest of the Caucasus, I think geography means a lot because geography is a determining factor and an in encouraging factor what happens in our part of the world. Uh, here's the Republic of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is a country approximately with the size of a state of Maine, 9.5 million people, uh, bordering Russian Federation, Iran, Armenia, Georgia, a little bit of Turkey and the Caspian Sea. Now, Couple of important things. Now, if you go back one slide, um, if you look at the Republic of Azerbaijan, you will see something which you don't have in any other place on earth. Only and only the Republic of Azerbaijan borders both Russian Federation and Iran. Russia and Iran. No other country in the world borders both. In fact, no other country in the world provides a corridor from east to west going between Russia and Iran. Now, while uh, the relationship with both Russia and Iran have been very important for us, it's culturally very enriching. We had very good years together. We alternatively been part of the uh, bigger Iranian empire and then from uh, 1828, a part of the Russian empire and the Soviet Union. So there's a lot of intercultural exchange, but still both are very big countries next to you. So you can imagine, now I know we just had a great guest at the mess hall, the superintendent of the Mexican Naval Academy. And I know Mexico is a great friend and a great neighbor of the United States of America. And so is Canada. And you feel very comfortable with your neighbors. Now imagine for a second that your great neighbors, Canada and Mexico, are still Canada and Mexico, friendly great nations. And you are 
and the size, size of a state of Maine. The United States of America borders Great Mexico, which is as it is now, and Great Canada, as it is now, and the United States of America is a state of Maine. I know you love Mexicans and Canadians. <laughs> but I know that Mr. Reese will be waking up at least two hours early in the morning just to check the horizon. <laughs> and I think that is a very important, that's a very important element. And that's what you have here. Also, think about this. This is the only place where the influence of the Russian cultural space, the Russian Empire, former Russian Empire, Iranian Empire, and the Tur Ottoman Empire, Turkic Empire, come together. Turkic world, Persian world, and Slavic world, Christianity and Islam, all come together. In fact, the border of extreme points here of southeastern Europe and the Middle East, that's where the border is. And once you come to that border and you cross it, it's unmistakable. You know where you meant to enter the Middle East, and you know where you enter uh, the Eastern Europe. And amazingly, amazingly, that border actually divides the same people. Because the entire north of the Islamic Republic of Iran, or in fact about 30 million people there, are actually ethnic Azeris. These lands were divided between the Russian and in the Iranian Empire in 1828, uh, but they divided the same people. So you have this part of Iran, mostly populated by Azeris, who are citizens of Iran, and who are pretty much a part of the Middle East, They're very much so as a part of the Middle East, perhaps the most important country today of the Middle East. And then you have much smaller population in the Republic of Azerbaijan, which is part of Eastern Europe, and a member of Council of Europe, member of the Organization of Security Cooperation of Europe, and all this. So that, those things all come together. So all of this determined what happened in Azerbaijan later on. And now, I, let me beat a little bit of my own drum. I think that's important. The Republic of Azerbaijan in 1918, in 1918, has become the first republic, democratic republic, with a predominantly Muslim population. The first ever republic in the Muslim world was built in Azerbaijan in 19, uh, on May 28th, 1918. Can you imagine that? Gave equal rights for everybody to vote, no matter religion, race, ethnicity, now more importantly, gender. Now, for the ladies in this room, ladies, listen to me. Listen to me, ladies. We gave the right for women to vote before the United States of America. Imagine, looking at this fat as a diplomat, it's not easy to imagine that. But it was true. <laughs> it is true. Except, except, we were, of course, of course, later than the state of Wyoming. I have to, by the way, I know this is even more surprising as I speak in the state of Maryland, that the state of Wyoming was ahead of the rest of the United States of America in terms of granting women's rights to vote. But that's not a question for me. <laughs> You're right here in the capital, you can talk to them. <laughs> so this is what happened. Azerbaijan became the first ever republic in the Muslim world. Can you imagine that? Now, at that time, not only Muslim nations were not republics or democracies, most of the European nations were monarchies. Right? Surprise, surprise. I know John Paul Jones would take certain, uh, what, what was it, Mark and letters of mark from different monarchs, it was very convenient. Um, we didn't do those kind of things. But uh, surprise is also there that many <coughs> great democracies of Europe today are also monarchies. We don't like to talk about this because, you know, it's kind of nice to have a king once in a while, wedding and stuff like that. That's good. <laughs> but don't forget that the aspiration of the people of America to have a republic which is free of monarchy and a republic and struggling to build an equal society was shared by the people of the Republic of Azerbaijan. And that's a very interesting development. Now, it didn't last too long in 1920, 23 months, exactly 23 months later, exactly 23 months later, April 28, 1920, the Bolshevik invasion coming from uh, then Russian um, Soviet, revolutionary Soviet, the government basically took over the Republic of Azerbaijan and ceased to exist as an independent nation until 1991 when Azerbaijan restored its independence, just as did the rest of the republics of the former <coughs> Soviet Union. And we became an independent state, which is 23 years ago, and we're very proud of it. Now, 
Let me tell you something. And this is, I think, is a very important, couple of very important factors. And I will sk skip over a couple of things because in the interest of time. But let me tell you this. Azerbaijan stands today as one of the most independent and most sovereign states in the former Soviet Union. And let me tell you how we got there. Okay, we all had Soviet past, 15 republics of the former Soviet Union. If you remove three Baltic republics, which had never been recognized as a part of the Soviet Union by the very United States were in, but the United States did recognize as a part, as, us as a part of the Soviet Union at that time. We all had totalitarian past in the Soviet regime. We all shared that past. We came from the 70 years of the Soviet domination. And we often refer to that. And the damaging effect, of course, on issues like war and education and brainwashing and ideology has been enormous. There were some good things, I have to say, education-wise. And you don't have to dismiss, you know, you don't have to throw the baby out with the water. I mean, it's enough to throw out the dirty water sometimes. Sometimes some things were not that bad. Gender rights were enforced. Uh, certain degree of industrialization, you know, electricity, all those things are not bad. So when people tell you social, socialism is very bad, socialism is pretty bad, but it has some good elements to that, just like everything else. Chocolate is bad, dark chocolate is good. You know. <laughs> so, uh, but, but, while we use the reference to our Soviet past as something that we uh, often use as an excuse, an explanation of what we do today, and once again, they're very valid. <clears throat> it doesn't explain why are the countries of the former Soviet Union are in a different places today. Why 23 years after the breakup of the Soviet Union, if everything was the same, why are we not in the same <coughs> spot today? And th that's where Azerbaijan comes into play. As much as our past matters, what really matters, if not more, than our past, is the decisions made in the respective sovereign capitals by, the so by every respective government since 1991. And I think this is an element which people don't fully understand. You need to understand that. It takes a, building an independent nation takes responsibility. Anybody in the world knows this, but I think Americans know it better than everybody else. And here I'm reminded about this in a, this whole history that basically having an independent country is a great thing. You know, you, you, you get to be an ambassador, you carry your passport, our guys get to wear a uniform with a flag and you wave, the fla uh, you wave your flag and all, this is all nice. You paint the airlines, your colors and all this. <laughs> but, but, that's not the whole thing. The most important thing is the responsibility for the future of your nation. And that's where Azerbaijan succeeded. And the man who spoke here in 1999, our ex-president, president, uh, Heydar Aliyev, he actually helped us a lot. I'll tell you why. First of all, it's not what you have, and Azerbaijan does have enormous uh, energy resources, but how you use it. Um, if we go a little bit further, for instance, I if you look at the um, Caspian Sea, Azerbaijan by far is not the largest producer or not the largest uh, reserve holder in the Caspian Sea in terms of oil. For instance, Kazakhstan has more oil, Russia has more oil, Iran obviously has more oil, Turkmenistan is uh, questionable, but they have a lot of gas. So if you look at the five literal states of the Caspian Sea, which is Russia, Azerbaijan, Iran, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan, it was in Baku, in the capital of Azerbaijan, in 1994, on September 20, 1994, that the single largest investment in the former Soviet Union happened. And that's $8 billion of investment of, in Azerbaijan's offshore oil fields. Why? Why come to a country which just had a civil war, which is still fighting the war with neighboring Armenia, has 1 million refugees, 20% occupied territory? Why would you invest into this? Because the government of Azerbaijan made this conscious decision to protect the foreign investments and ensure sanctity of contract the way no other country in the region has done so, so far. And what is the result? The result today is the strategic bakut bilisi Jehan pipeline, which is the red line here. It goes to Azerbaijan, Georgia, 
Turkey and ends up in the Mediterranean port of Jehan, the open seaport of Turkey. It provides about 40% of Israel's oil, become a major, it's a boon for energy security of Europe. How did that happen? I'll give you another thing which is very important. If you ask, if you ask Americans today, in 22 years of American, uh, of American influence and cooperation with the countries of the former Soviet Union, what is the most tangible and successful project they have completed? Some would say disarmament. Some would say uh, several years ago it was cover revolutions throughout the world. And as we see Ukraine burning today, which is a very tragic story, and we could talk about that more, and we need all to make sure that people of Ukraine live in a peaceful, democratic state. That's very important. But you would, you would not call the Orange Revolution in Ukraine today is a great success, unless you don't watch CNN. Or you only watch the CNN part about Justin Bieber. They, they show it to him. <laughs> but the most successful part of US policy has been this tangible connection. Bakut Bilisi Jehan pipeline. Remember in 1996, when we began talking about that pipeline, there was no member of NATO who is Bulgaria, Poland, or anybody else. It was only Turkey. There was a first physical infrastructure connection between the Caspian Sea to the Black Sea and to the Mediterranean Sea. It was a, we changed the geography. We created a new region, Caspian Black Sea Mediterranean region. It became a new reality. It took Azerbaijan and Georgia out of a traditional post-Soviet, what I call ghetto of thinking. It became, we became parts of a bigger Mediterranean region. So how did it happen? I have to commend both Clinton and Bush administrations for doing that. They, they have done a great support to us. They've been a great partner in building that pipeline to Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. And here comes the most important thing for anybody who deals with American policy in the region to remember. The discussion on the pipeline began in 1996. It was successfully completed by 2006. 10 years. If you listen to Professor Ries often enough, you would know that 10 years is longer than any two consecutive administrations, which means that that project could not have been Clinton project, Bush project, or Obama project. It could only succeed as an America project. And that's the most important thing we need to know. America's partners in the region, and we are American partners, need to know that the commitment does not end with the four years of a particular administration. That this is not a one administration four-year project. That that is a commitment of the United States of America. And since everybody knew that that was important for the United States of America, it succeeded. It would never succeed if the policy is not consistent, long-term, and representative of the entire consensus of American politics. And that, I think, is a very important factor. And that shows that shows two things. One, A, what succeeds, and I will not talk about things which did not succeed because they do not really have to do with Azerbaijan. I think Professor Ries will uh, elaborate on that. And before, we, uh, before I complete, I wanted to say uh, a couple of things. We have now building a gas pipeline, a gas pipeline which will change the region. Will, it will become a trans, it's called Southern Corridor. It comes from South Caucasus pipeline, goes to uh, Trans-Anatolian pipeline, goes to Trans-Adriatic pipeline, creates an absolutely new reality. Once again, Azerbaijan is behind changing the entire geography of Southern Europe. That, I think, is very important to understand. It will also become a major contributor to Europe's energy security. I know Natik insists me to show something, the geographic importance of Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijani oil has always been something which is very important. Two names, two infamous names are linked to Baku. One is that there was jail in Baku, was jail in Baku, which is actually now is the office of BP, it's quite telling. And the only person who escaped from that, that jail was Joseph Stalin. Now, I mean, I tell you something, <laughs> if, if there's one guy you don't want to let go, that was Joseph Stalin, you, <laughs> let the others go, keep that guy. But apparently it didn't work out. The other one is of course Adolf Hitler. And you would see the video of his birthday when he was asked, yeah, he was asked, Adolf Hitler was asked, he was given a birthday cake by his, uh, by his lieutenants and he was asked, what is the, your favorite part? And he said, I wanna see 
uh, I want and he cuts out Baku because that's what he wanted to have in order to win World War II. I, th I think that's probably, I don't know if it's working. It's working, but uh, anyway, you know, it works. Yeah, I don't know. Then the final point is that since Azerbaijan emerged as an independent country, we had a conflict with neighbor. I, I don't know, he's cutting, Hitler is cutting, it's a very unpleasant view for me anyway. So, uh, since Azerbaijan became an independent country, unfortunately we had conflict with neighboring Armenia. Armenia today occupies 20% of Azerbaijani territory, internationally recognized Azerbaijani territory. The United States and the entire world recognizes uh, this part of Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh, as an uh, as a, as a internationally recognized Azerbaijan territory. One million refugees, and very tragic situation. As a result, as a result Armenia is self-isolated from the region, has become a toy in foreign hands, and unfortunately, missed the chance to build a generally independent country. Now, the United States of America helps us and Armenians to find a, a common ground and peace. <coughs> but if Americans really want to succeed in the region, they need to be a little bit more consistent. Now, this conflict right here on the border of <coughs> Iran, Turkey, given the fact the presence of Russian military presence in this part of Armenia, means that that remains the most dangerous the most explosive threat to the future stability of a very strategically important region. So I think that we need to remember that. Anyway, uh, on the final point, Azerbaijani troops were the only Muslim combat troops as a part of the coalition in Iraq. Our guys served in Balkans and were now in Afghanistan. And the transit, uh, US Transcom transit over Azerbaijan takes about 40% of NDN, and it's a very successful cooperation we have with the U.S. Transportation Command. Anyway, I think I spoke for too long, so, no, we're good. Mr. is there any questions? Some time for some questions. Yeah. Incredibly important strategic part of the world. Uh, Professor Tucker, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Professor. I really appreciate that. I wanted to comment on uh, Azerbaijan's uh, relations with Iran currently. Uh, it's an interesting question because America's, uh, that's Baku, my capital, by the way. Uh, the relationship between the United States and Iran are go undergoing a very interesting transformation. So in many ways it affects other people's relations. We have a uh, great cultural connection with Iran. It's our longest border. We have a uh, you know, families on both sides, we share religion, share culture. Uh, but one, don't, one thing we don't share is Azerbaijan is a staunchly secular pro-Western nation. Uh, Iran uh, is a religious state. We believe that they have a right to build a country there when they want to, but we do have the same right as well. So as long as both nations respect each other, each other's sovereignty and independence, I think we'll be okay. But that's, uh, that is if. Have time for another question. Uh, That's a great question. Uh, you become a little bit more cynical because you know that not everybody, not everything people tell you, including the ambassador from Azerbaijan, is necessarily true and should be taken at the face value. Uh, great empires make mistakes. And the great mistakes, the bigger the empire, the bigger the mistake and the consequence. I think we should never forget that. Uh, great thing, I'm very proud to be independent. I was a Soviet citizen. I'm very proud to be a citizen of independent Azerbaijan. And there was no greater joy for me than to see my country become independent. And we've done it and we participated in that. But I saw how it happens. Soviet Union lost respect for its citizens. Uh, it lost its moral compass and was no longer benefiting people in its country. Uh, but it also got a little bit too keen to invade other countries and to kill its own citizens quite um, casually. I, I don't want to go too much into details, but on January 1920, 1990, Soviet troops came, came to Baku and killed about 160 people in the street indiscriminately. That was a day when I, of course, ceased to be 
for myself inside a citizen of the Soviet Union. However, there was a cautionary tale. Uh, might is very good, and you're part of the might of the United States of America. But might is only right when it's on the right cause, and also only right when it's applied very carefully. Uh, when a country as big, as great as the United States of America uses, uh, it's, you don't, I mean, we're not talking about it, just force, it's weight, gravi it's gravitas. It has to use it for the purpose of very chosen, very carefully applied courses. I mean, the United States could do more in promoting peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan, could do more to promote stability in our region. It chooses to do other things. You know, the lessons we all have to learn. Let's thank the ambassador for his time. It would not be a visit without uh, a gift of our Thank you. This is very good. This is very yeah, good. memento for, our, for your trip. Oh, yeah. look, I opened the first page of the airplanes. No ships. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what happened? <laughs>